Hello, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. Uh, today we're here with uh, Robbie Dermody. He's the co founder of uh, Counterparty, and many of you will have heard of Counterparty. It's one of the uh, the leading sort of Bitcoin 2.0 protocols, and it's, it's gotten a lot of uh, traction over the last year. So uh, thanks for joining us today, Robbie. Absolutely. Good to be on the show. Yeah, I think we, we've actually had quite a few uh, projects on the show that have done things on top of Counterparty. I mean, we've had Swarm on ages ago. We've had uh, Gems on. Coinify. Uh, Adam Levine. Um, yeah, so and this I think there's probably a few others that we've had on that have done things with Counterparty. It seems to have sort of become the platform of choice for many people, especially when they're doing um, crowdfunding campaigns. Yeah, and I, th I think that was really one of our major goals from the start. So it's it's good to see that, um, like both getting people using the technology as 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 end users and also developing it with with the technology. So we've um, we saw the first uh, initially where people start, were starting to use it more and more, and, and we actually, um, uh, interesting enough, we just crossed uh, uh, the 200,000 transactions uh, mark. So I think it took us about 10 months to get to the 100,000 100, transactions mark, and I think in four months we went from 100 to 200. So the rate's definitely kicking up. I think uh, if we keep this rate up, we'll be at about a half a million by the, by the end of the year, which is, uh, which is great. That's impressive. So, um, yeah, and then on top of that, we've been seeing um, some folks. Um, we've had a number of new developers. We had a Chrome wallet come out for, for Counterparty that looks great. Um, we had CoinDaddy um, launched, and they're really creating a lot of new assets on the network. I think that uh, we heard we have more, more assets on Counterparty now than Doge Party, and, and Doge Party has a lot of assets. <laughs> um, and then we had, uh, you know, BlockScan is doing some great stuff with, with their Block Explorer, adding, uh, adding stuff like voting functionality, which we're using for the, the elections. Um, and then, you know, you mentioned Coinify and what they're doing with, with these, uh, with these uh, app coin crowd sales. So there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of folks doing some neat stuff. So uh, maybe also for those who aren't as familiar with Counterparty, can you give a, a brief introduction to what the main goal is of the project? Yeah, so uh, really Counterparty started out, our, our, our main interest is to create a, um, a layer of extended functionality on top of the Bitcoin blockchain, and with that to be able to do, we, we were really focused on financial applications, so things like custom assets, um, a decentralized exchange, um, you know, we ended up adding in the smart contracts functionality. At first we had some initial um, financial instruments like uh, contracts for difference and things uh, in the binary options, which uh, is like a bet. We had those hard-coded in, um, but now we've added these, these smart contracts, and I, I guess we'll get into that here a little bit later. Um, but but the, the, the main idea behind Counterparty was to um, have this kind of financial meta, meta layer, is, is what some people call it, on top of, on top of the Bitcoin transaction. Um, and it does that by just embedding the counterparty protocol data, which is structured in a certain way within Bitcoin, within uh, stuffing that data into Bitcoin transactions. And so from a Bitcoin miner, they look like just regular Bitcoin transactions. And how has the project evolved? I know you guys have become uh, one of the things you also very well known for is the initial uh, issuance of counterparty, you know, which was by burning and destroying Bitcoin, which I think is a really is a really clever way of going about it, right? Because it sort of benefits all the Bitcoin holders and it doesn't benefit you guys. So it, I think it gets rid of a lot of the issues that other people have had where, you know, the, you have strange incentives, no way all of a sudden you get all this money and... Uh... Yeah, it was, it was a clever way to make $1.8 million disappear at the, at the, <laughs> at the end of it. <laughs> well, and I mean, in a sense, you could say it went to, uh, it was a sort of... A donation yeah, the, to all the other Bitcoin holders that didn't participate. Yeah, I mean it's slightly. Um, yeah, it it was. You, you could say that, and um, I think that it also when you when you think about proof of work with Bitcoin, um, you're essentially converting um, one thing of value into another thing. So in the case of proof of work, it's it's electricity and the the cost you pay for that, as well as any kind of capital expenditures with the mining equipment. You're, you're converting that that electricity. Um, 
and, and you're, in, you're depreciating investment in mining equipment, you're converting that into Bitcoins. There's some chance to get Bitcoins. Um, with, um, with Counterparty, likewise, you're converting Bitcoins and the investment that you have with Bitcoin, whether you mine them or bought them or whatever, you convert you, during the proof of burn period, you converted that into XCP. So it was really, um, it allowed us to have a, 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 a fair way you know, a merit-based fair way to to uh, release this currency and get it distributed um, amongst a, a community or population without us um, taking on risk from the standpoint of are we issuing a security or not based on like you know uh, U.S. regulations or, or what have you, and then also um, you know taking people's money can be it can be a blessing if you you know you needed to actually get things done and hire people and all of that, but it can also be a curse in, in the standpoint that there's all these expectations that is, are, are now placed on you and then you're beholden to, um, to, to other interests that you have to stay very cognizant of. So, uh, you know, with Counterparty, it was... I, it, at first, we, you know, it, we were thinking from a technical standpoint, it didn't... We, we were able to release this and, you know, we've actually up until, I think, November, we were really or December even, we were really just paying for things out of pocket, us, us three found, uh, co-founders. Um, and uh, that got us to where we are now, and um, now things have gotten to the point where that's not really necessary anymore, but for the most part. But, but it, 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 was, it, it made us really to get things to be really streamlined, um, you know, really scrappy, and um, make we had to make the right decisions because we couldn't waste money. I mean, or, or misuse money. We we didn't we didn't have that option. Um, so we were always focused on 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 uh, what day to day kind of stuff, very tactical and and very evolutionary. Instead of proposing this huge new system that there's a ton of risks in, because this is risky enough doing doing what what we did. So um, I think it had our focus in the right place and. Um, you know, there's all, more things we could have done around marketing and, 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 and PR and things like that, I think, if we had some additional funds. But um, I think a lot of, you know, just the worth of counterparty just spread through the community and people actually using it, which, which was great. So I think I would consider the, me the model that we did successful, but it really takes a focused team to, to knock that out, uh, you know. <laughs> because the resources are just so on so short demand, so it really yeah. I mean, I'm sure there. I'm sure at times you would have been glad if, if there had been a million or two million or something of funds you now for development. But yeah, yeah, and 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 I, you know, I, I I think so, and I think less for development than than everything else. But but you know, the most expensive resource with anybody is is um is just is, is uh, the human resources, like just having people and paying, paying for their salaries. Um, so that's the most expensive part by far. And, and uh, I mean, before Counterparty, I actually built a, and I, I still have it, this 20-plus uh, person technology company, and I bootstrapped that so we didn't get investor funding. And so you kind of learn how to um, build something from nothing and kind of like walk into, uh, walk into a, an operating uh, a, a organization. Instead of just like you know, you can't you can't just put everything in place day one. You have to scale up. You start with one person, and you're you have all these hats, and then you kind of just get additional people as 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 you have funding, and, and just move them into different roles and, and delegate to them. So that's kind of the approach we took with with Counterparty. And we have some really talented folks on the team that are extremely hardworking. So that's that's kind of been, the, and that's a huge part of the secret of our success um, so far. That definitely does sound familiar. <laughs> Yeah. Taking something from nothing and then doing doing with the resources that you have. Uh, so you know that was then. This is now. How how has the project evolved from then? Um, what does the team look like now? Um, God, we have so we have the three co-founders, Evan, Adam, and myself, and then we also have uh, a full-time developer Uziel. We have Ivana. We have uh, a few support guys. Um, and then, and then, you know, we work with a number of other folks in the community that are building around Counterparty. So I think from the start, you know, when, when we initially made it, we released the reference client, Counterparty D, as it was called at the time. And um, we got into it. That was January of 2014. And then we got into it where people were using it, but, but um, it's, it was command line. So it was, it was uh, 
I think most people just do not like command line interfaces. Um, <laughs> I like them, but, but I like them. <laughs> I'm a developer, so <laughs> so so you know there was uh, there was waiting for a, 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 a GUI type interface, and Adam wrote the command line. Uh, he wrote Counterparty D, the reference client, um, back I think in November of 2014. He was just he just knocked that out, and then I helped out with the API and the documentation and the build system, and then. Um, I added those parts to it, and then we got in. It was about end of January, and I was like, you know, oh, geez, someone needs to. Uh, we need a wallet. We need a graphical interface for this. So I sat down for three months and knocked that out, and just 80, 80 plus hour weeks. And you know, my cat was my best friend, and and <laughs> it was just it was brutal. You're talking and about we got, we the got that wallet. out. Yeah, and and um, so that was counter wallet, and and now we had an interface. And at that point, things really started to grow with the community. People started getting. Uh, things get many more traction. I think one of our uh, initial big wins was Let's Talk Bitcoin, and uh, Devin and, and Adam have been, and, and the rest of the team has been great. They, they've added a lot of value and new technology um, to that, and really cool stuff they're doing. And then from there, we, 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 we you know, Swarm and, and um, uh, you know, Coinify ended up coming on in the fall, I think. Uh, Block Scan was an early one, too, where uh, Matt was really just... He, he, we needed a block explorer, so someone from the community just made it. So, um, yeah. So over that, over that whole last year, we started seeing a lot more people getting interested. And I'm, and you know, having users of the coin is is great, but having developers is 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 even better because they do cool stuff that 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 will attract more users. And um, that was really our goal. We 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 knew we were a small team and we could only do so much. So. We wanted to attract developers. We wanted to have the technology out there, open source, and really make it so that at some point we could fade more into the background. And and that's, you know, if you, I said all that to say that really where Counterparty's going, I think, is is that that um, I've been really excited seeing things like wallets, like Counter Wallet. We did Counter Wallet because we had to, like someone had to do, it, and I was like, all right, let's just let's just knock it out. Um, but now there's this Chrome Wallet coming out. I mean, there's there's more user friendly things like Coin Daddy. There's um, additional things, block scans, adding more functionality, and other developers are getting interested, and that was really the plan for the start, um, where where we want these wallets being run by and created by by people in the Bitcoin community, uh, in the counterparty communities that are just interested in doing that, and if they can make a business around it and make money on it, then then great. Um, so, like long term, that's our plan. Is that is that to really create the sustainable open source uh, thing with its own community that the founders aren't having to push everything. We we did it initially so that we could get uh, kind of get accelerated adoption. Um, otherwise, it would probably take four or five years, like it did with Bitcoin, which is more organic. So we kind of accelerated it along, but but um, but um, you know, I think we're starting to see this 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 growth of this robust uh, ecosystem and, and people that have ties to the technology uh, beyond just the founders, which is which is great to see. I'm curious. So, when you mentioned LTB, you mentioned Swarm, and those are some of the early projects to to uh, get on board with Counterparty. Uh, how valuable was it for you and the team to have those projects come on board at such early stages in the project um, as sort of initial test uh, coins? I mean, not really test coins, but like initial uh, um, uh, products being developed on on top of uh, Counterparty. Yeah, I mean, it it, it was. Really valuable because um, you know when when you're doing this and especially when you have some competition or or, or what may be competition, um, it's important to just you got to switch your game up. So when you start out, you know you have issues. Um, there was there was some there was some uh, wasn't really the issues. It was more drama around the the Bitcoin core devs when we did and off this whole op return thing, and then and then we had things with. Um, you know, potential competition with with Mastercoin, and then there's all this other stuff going on, and 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 and, and so so the goals change on a, on a weekly or monthly basis as far as what's the most important thing to be focusing on. So so with those initial big wins, um, they were huge because they really set. Um, I mean, you're really looking at okay, what's uh, you know, how do I evaluate one one solution from another, a counterparty or Mastercoin or whatnot, and 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 um, a lot of it is like who else is using it. That's what a lot of people ask, especially people that um, are maybe not technical enough to evaluate. Go into the source code and look at that. 
So um, those those initial ones were huge. After that, we were kind of just setting them up a, up a momentum, and this and the 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 priority really changed more towards um, you know continuing to do that and work with these companies, but also just uh, it, enhancing the support capabilities of the software, um, you know, the stability of it, and 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 getting something more uh, uh, more transparent with the counterparty foundation. So we would just kind of take things as they come when we saw a need for something, and then instead of trying to tackle everything at once. Today's magic word is asset. That's A S S E T. Go to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. So can we talk a bit about the different components? So you've mentioned counterparty D. This kind mm-hmm. of like wallet, and we also saw something called kind of block. And on your website, there's a kind of party lib listed. Yep. Um, what are the different functions that the, these components have? Yep. And I got the the handy dandy uh, diagram that we made up here now. So, um, yeah. So initially, when we created this, there was there was a counter counterparty um, counterparty D. Which has been um, oh, there. We go. Great. May, may need to get a little bit larger, but um, initially there was a counterparty D, which which was really the it was a command line interface in the reference client all in one. Uh, what we've done since then is this, uh, it, like I think a month or two ago, I think about two months ago, um, that was split into a, a a Python library and then the actual command line client, which is counterparty CLI for command line interface. Um, so that counterparty lib is actually the library that handles like the encoding of transactions, the parsing of the blockchain, things like that, uh, for counterparty transactions. Um, and then we had the command line interface split off with it. And likewise, we have um, uh, counterparty lib actually talks to Bitcoin. So how counterparty works is it's it's an embedded consensus system, like uh, I said earlier, where it pulls in Bitcoin transactions and it looks at each Bitcoin transaction and sees if if there's counterparty data encoded into the, the outputs of that transaction. And if there are, then we'll just go and parse that data and say, oh, this is a send from, you know, for a thousand storage coins or, or, or LTB coins from this address, bit, from this Bitcoin address to this one, or this is, uh, I'm creating an asset or whatever. Um, so it has its own internal ledger separate from, from the, the Bitcoin ledger. Um, so counterparty lib basically reads off interfaces with Bitcoin Core or or BTCD as we're adding support for as well, and reads those transactions. Um, and then we have the command line interface to counterparty lib, and then we also have a new component called counterparty GUI, which is a, a Qt based a desktop client uh, that's written in Python, and that's in beta stage right now. Um, so Uziel from our team is working on that. Um, and and then you have this other component. Uh, counter block, which interf- which lays on top of counterparty lib. This is an optional component. Um, this is something that that I created back when uh, we I was making counter wallet, and um, it it adds like so so counterparty lib only has a concept of um, actual transactions. So so meaning like people are sending money to each other. Um, someone creates an order on the decentralized exchange, and and the order is filled. It doesn't have the concept of like asset pairs and markets and order books and the current trading price and things like that. And there's some additional stuff as far as like getting the current state state of an asset at a given time. Like, is it is it is it uh, locked? Is it not locked? Is what's the current description? Um, and then you basically just compile that by looking through the blockchain and like seeing what changed. So there were certain kind of nice to have things that were necessary for counter wallet that that wasn't there. So we we made a separate component from there that just interfaces and kind of adds that extended functionality. So much like the uh, Bitcoin Core client has no uh, idea of what the balance of an address is. Yes. Uh, this sort of adds that extra layer of functionality on top. Yeah, and people have done this with Bitcoin with things like Insight uh, from. Uh, BitPay and 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 several other things that lay on top of Bitcoin and make it more friendly. You know, uh, Gem, for instance, what they're doing. Um, it's it's similar to those concepts. So there's like um, you can get the order book on the decks and you can do things like that. Um, and moreover, Counterblock has a plugin ar- architecture where you can create custom plugins. So um, for instance, Symbian 
when we get into Symbian, what that is, but it's the startup that we just started, um, or recently started, we released a, a Ripple uh, counterparty gateway. And that gateway was actually written as a counterblock plugin. So, it, so it's actually, you enable it in counterblock, and then when counterblock starts up, it, it, it will know to initialize this plugin, and then if it receives a block, uh, the plugin may have custom code that runs for when it gets that block or that transaction and examines a transaction. So that's counterblock, and then and counterwallet kind of hangs off a of counterblock and and counterparty lib, and and um, uh, it 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 really uses a full functionality of both. Um, it's got a it's a pretty. Um, I'm I'm glad to see like the Chrome wallet, and I'm glad to see counterparty GUI. Those are more basic wallets, and they're they don't have the the decentralized exchange, but they do have the asset sending, which is like 90% of what people want to do. Um, it's just send send you know like you know, interface with a vending machine by sending some Bitcoin to it or, or send some LTB coin from one person to another or some XCP or whatever. So um, those those are other wallets that are, are simpler than Counter Wallet is. But Counter Wallet was our first, our first graphical or web wallet, and um, it had a really important role, and, it's, and it still does today. So we maintain it today as well. So our... So th this Chrome uh, wallet that you mentioned is built on top of Counterblock. No, I think the Chrome wallet. I'm not quite sure. Um, I think I think it it interfaces with the APIs that Blockscan has created and the ones that CoinDaddy oh, okay. has created. Okay. So you had these these other parties. Um, Blockscan scan just works against Counterparty D, and he wrote his own code because Counterblock didn't exist at the time when when he initially started work on Blockscan. And CoinDaddy, he may be using Counterblock and Counterparty D, or he may just be using Counterparty D, I'm not sure, but they essentially created their own web services, and they have their own APIs, which are, are, are pretty user-friendly. You just hit some URL and, you know, get, get information for a specific asset, and it gives it back to you, for instance. So what BlockScan is doing is similar to what you built with Counterblock, then? There's just some, it's some yeah, application well, functionality there? Block, block scan is more of a end user website, and he wrote that code to be able to display stuff on the website. Where Counterblock is more of a internal component, where right. you can you can build a website on Counterblock, and we did that with Counterparty D. Where that you know when you when, I'm I'm sorry, we did that with Counterwallet. Where when you start up Counterwallet and you log into your wallet and you see that and you send some assets, it's actually making API calls to the server uh, that that Counterblock or Counterparty D are answering. Okay, and so. Just in terms of uh, infrastructure architecture, so counterparty lib is a component of the counterparty server, which is run on individual nodes. And where does is that correct? And where does counterblock sit in there? Like, where would you talk about yeah, a server? So, yeah. So we have, uh, and, and uh, just to make it clear, so um, with counterblock is something that only some people need to run. Um, if you are just like an end user or you know, if you're making even making a website to do counterparty stuff, you may find some benefit with having counterblock, but you don't. You 50 percent of the time you don't need it. You can just use counterparty D. So if if you have a if you want to create an application, um, you may not need counterblock at all. It may have no value for you. Um, and people, if people, if it doesn't, you should just work with counterparty D directly. Um, it, what was your ask me your question? So, so my, my I guess my question where I was getting to is counterparty lib oh. is is basically oh, counterparty D. Yeah, the server. Okay, and and so the nodes are running counterparty lib, and this is sort of the 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 lowest level that you can run to participate in counterparty. Counterblock is is uh, optional. Yeah. So so you essentially. Um, um, say in the case of BlockScan, for instance, he's got his website uh, software like IIS or Apache or whatever, and he's got his, his custom code, PHP or, or Django, Python, whatever whatever he's doing. Sure, yeah. And then he also has a instance or one or more instances of counterparty server running, which is basically this counterparty lib that runs as a, uh, as, as a server just like Apache would run, for instance, uh, the web server. And um, and that that has an API interface, and his software will make calls to that API and get data from it. Um, in the case of Counter Wallet, we have these things called federated nodes, which is kind of an all-in-one packaging of um, Counterblock and the Counterparty server and Bitcoin that run on a server. So we have a few of these servers that run all the software together, and um, and then Counter Wallet, the web client, will make API calls to that. So you know, and 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 also it does it does some other cool stuff like client. Uh, side validation, so it can validate 
that the information that counterparty uh, Live gets back, like, so create a send transaction. It can it can sanity check that on the client side and say, oh, this is actually this is what I think it is. It's going to the right address. And, and counterparty GUI does that as well. And then um, and, and and then it can also do um, you know it also like when you when you create a wallet or, or log into your wallet, none of those details go to the server side. So it's it's a completely client side wallet. Your private keys are are kept in your browser essentially. Okay. So, uh, so just uh, if uh, for those of you listening, uh, you can go to the Counterparty website in the docs page to see uh, more about um, about what we just talked about, and we'll have the link in the show notes as well. So, one of the interesting things, and, and you mentioned it briefly, right, is that the Counterparty sort of utilizes the the security and the consensus of the Bitcoin blockchain, right? That you you just write uh, the data into the Bitcoin blockchain. It's secured by Bitcoin mining. Counterparty doesn't have to worry about you know proof of stake or the proof of work or what kind of algorithm. Or all of that is sort of taken care of by uh, the Bitcoin blockchain. But it's 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 an interesting thing to sort of wrap your head around how that works, right? Because then miners don't understand counterparty; they don't have a conception of of what that is. So, can you talk a little bit about what the trade-offs are between these embedded consensus systems and um, and systems that are you know their own and truly decentralized, or that run their own consensus system? Oh. Um... Yeah, so the embedded consensus system approach is, is interesting. It, 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 it is, um, I think it's very much like um, the, the Internet itself, like if you consider the, the protocol suite that runs the Internet, TCP, IP, and then you have um, TCP and IP, and you have all these routers all over the Internet that, that run that. And, um, you know, if, if, if um, you know, Facebook can just create their own website, and they don't have to ask permission from the the owners and operators of these routers and companies like Cisco um, to upgrade their routers to to add that because they're just embedding the data in in the packets that these routers are pa passing across. So um, it, it, likewise with with Bitcoin, we just embed our data into the Bitcoin uh, transactions, and we didn't have to ask permission from the Bitcoin core devs or the Bitcoin community to do it. We just did it. So it, in that sense, it was um, a bit disruptive. Uh, as, far, as far as disruptive technology goes, um, and, and 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 so you have this concept where you kind of have a a, 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 a network or a set of you know this markets on top of a, a, a payment system, which is kind of cool to think about. So if, if Bitcoin is kind of the internet of money, which rides on the the internet itself, and then counterparty is is like markets which are in that internet of money. Or, it's kind of a crude analogy, but. Um, with, yeah, did, did, is, uh, in, as far as comparing that to other other approaches like, um, you know, colored coins uses a, di a slightly different approach. Uh, they 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 utilize a Bitcoin script system, um, and it's not embedded consensus where it's actually they're embedding data into uh, outputs and just uh, stuffing the data in there. Um, and then there's always the opportunity where you create your own blockchain. And uh, when you have your own blockchain, via coin, for instance, you can have transactions. You can make it so that you can encode. You can either go from a a, a Bitcoin drive blockchain, where you're still using the kind of model that Bitcoin itself uses, with inputs and outputs, and 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 different um, script out codes like op return and and, and multi-sig data encoding and things like that. Um, and that's something like Viacoin took with with a fork counterparty, and they also forked Bitcoin or Litecoin or whatever they used, and um, they made it so you could stuff more data into op return. So they didn't need to use different forms or more creative forms of of, of data encoding like we did um, because they weren't working on Bitcoin, and and they were have, able to have shorter block times. So um, what's the role here of the domain client, right? Because we were talking with uh, Flavian of, of CoinPrism. Uh, at the conference in Berlin, and he was pointing out something interesting, right? That with with um, open asset protocol, you sort of have a, a, a simple protocol, and then people write their own implementations of it and their own wallets of it. Is there something similar going on with counterparty, or is with counterparty sort of the client 
also, you know, the reference, and there can't really be a place for people running their own implementations. Um, uh, implementations is a is it's a, it's a it's a big word. I mean, are you talking implementations of the actual protocol, like secondary? To implementation yeah, that if somebody else protocol? writes uh, writes their own uh, counterparty client that mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, maybe from scratch, totally different code. Yeah, um, that's totally possible, and I think there's actually a guy doing to that, doing that today in Go or something. I'm, I, Adam was telling me that there's someone doing that, um, and 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 moreover, uh, I think Devin from LTB Coin he started a a GitHub repository where he's basically lays out the the protocol. Um, so he's creating a protocol specification for Counterparty, which you can you know if you want to see how Counterparty does, the best place to look is in the Counterparty lib source code. But he's creating one that explains a lot of the data encoding, decoding, um, things like that in, pl in plain English. Um, so that would be a good, a good source, uh, you know, a good like written specification as well. So, and you know, anybody's anybody's free to um, create their own reference client to do that. And it's, it's very much like Bitcoin. If you do that, you need to make sure that it really matches up exactly with what the counterparty live the, the our, our well to create their own client it won't be a reference client you, but you have to make sure it matches up with what the reference client is doing much like the guys that made BTCD which is a bitcoin alternative client they have to make that the, make sure that their stuff matches up exactly with what a bitcoin D which is the bitcoin reference client is doing otherwise you'll get a protocol fork um, so there, there's similar similar technical issues um, as well or you could get a protocol fork and so, th was this uh, sort of a strategic choice to do it like this, have a reference client rather than a protocol specification, or this? It, it was re it was really things were evolving pretty quickly. We we um, really we 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 really the specification was a code, and we kind of took that from the Bitcoin model, where you know Satoshi didn't release a, a formal detailed Bitcoin specification. He mostly just wrote the code, and and you can just look at you know developers can look at the code and. And, um, and 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 see how Bitcoin works from there. But now it's like having a written specification for counterparty is is also a very good thing too. So um, so so we're having that as well. But when we got started, we didn't need it, and 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 things have stabilized more. So creating secondary clients could be could is is a more realistic or tenable thing if someone wants to do that than when we were getting started, where things were changing all the time. Okay. Okay, well, uh, there's lots more to talk about. Uh, before we do that, we'd like to talk about our sponsor, Shapeshift. Shapeshift is, of course, the fast and easy way to buy and sell altcoins. Uh, if you've ever tried to buy altcoins from an exchange, you know that uh, it's not always the easiest thing to do because you have to create an account, um, get that validated, place an order, wait for the order to be fulfilled, and that just takes a long time. And, you know, you want to be able to buy your Dogecoin really fast or sell Litecoin for... Uh, for Bitcoin really fast. So Shapeshift, uh, you go to shapeshift.io and uh, it's basically a currency conversion tool, sort of like Google Translate for cryptocurrencies. On one side you have the currency you want to convert, on the other side you have the currency you want to convert to. You simply uh, enter the address of the payment, so for instance if you want to convert some uh, Dogecoin into Litecoin, you would put your Litecoin address and then all you would do is simply send uh, some ghost coin to um, the address that they specify, and in just a few seconds you get Litecoin in your account. So it's really fast. It takes about 30 seconds. Uh, there's no confirmation time. So as soon as you send, for instance, in this example, your Dogecoin to uh, the Dogecoin address, you get Litecoin in your account in about 30 seconds. So they support uh, now up to, I believe it's about 25 currencies. Uh, they just added the. Winklevi currency. No, I'm kidding. It was an April Fool's joke. Um, but yeah, so they've got about 25 different currencies that support there on their website. And they've got some really cool tools as well that we've talked about in the past, like the Shapeshift lens and also uh, the ability to embed the Shapeshift button right on your website so you can accept just about any altcoin for, uh, for Bitcoin. So great if you're doing tipping on your website, as we are. So go to shapeshift.io, give it a try, and we'd like to thank them for the support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So one of the challenges 
of uh, what you guys are doing you know, is that it's very difficult to have uh, SPV verification or some sort of smartphone verification that you have to, you have to actually trust a, a server somewhere. Is there some way you uh, plan to address that problem? Um, I mean, with, with, with Counterparty, because it's embedded consensus, you really can't have um, uh, SPV as you can with plain Bitcoin, where you just have thin clients just, <laughs> you know, verifying block headers and, and getting transactions as they need. Um, you really, because something has to look at every Bitcoin transaction as it parses through the blockchain to um, determine what's a counterparty transaction and what's not. So I don't think you can get past that component. It, it, it hasn't really proven itself to be a big deal, um, to be honest. There are other approaches that you can take, such as having a, a network of trusted servers. Um, um, you, can, you can also do, you know, where, where you make sure the servers agree. That's an approach we take with CounterWallet. When you send a, a create a transaction with CounterWallet, it actually queries both servers. It, it, it issues a code to get uh, the, the API call to get a, um, a raw hex transaction to actually send that asset, like the raw Bitcoin data transaction. Um, and then it the client will compare the two, and if they differ, it's going to raise an alert and say something, something's wrong, like one of the servers maybe got compromised or something like that. Um, so it, there are approaches to do that as a combination of having multiple servers and doing client-side validation. And, you, and the client can also, like we said, uh, counterparty GUI is doing today, and CounterWallet does to some extent, which is uh, parse apart the transaction on the client side and, 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 and verify things, uh, that verify what the server told it. So... Um, from a security perspective, there's ways to pretty much mitigate the, the, the security risk by those the combination of those two things. Um, yeah. And then, yeah. and then you can utilize. Uh, I mean, just going off of a server from a performance perspective, it's about the same the same speed. You know, a, a thin web client, but you, you just that, have to work with the server. Do you think that that will perhaps cause issues uh, in the future? The, the fact that having SPV, like if and when, like counterparty becomes. Um, you know, you used like massively uh, for uh, um, for assets, perhaps for like large companies and things like that. I, I think if if you have a service that's being highly used, taking the appropriate precautions like having multiple servers and doing client side validation. I mean, you really it really can you find easily. I think ninety nine percent of the the, the the things at least be alerted to it. Um, um, so, so you can at the very least alert and know that something's up and prevent the transaction or do some something like that. I, I don't think, from a use, usability and user perspective, I don't think most users know, and I don't think most users care because um, they what they want. I think what most users want to be able to do is they don't want to have to download software. They want to be able to go something, log in on some website, and, and get it get get what they want right then and there. And you can do that. Like you go to CounterWallet, and yeah, there's a server in the background that parses a blockchain, but I mean, you don't need to know that, and you don't need to install that server and run it and deal with that. You can, and, and if you want to have a full node, um, you can run counterparty GUI, and you can, um, or run your own local counter wallet server, for instance, and you can and you can know that you're parsing directly off the Bitcoin blockchain. So, so, but most 99%, probably 95% of people don't need that, don't want that, um, but we do have that option as well. And do you think the the counterparty GUI is going to play an important role that uh, people, I guess, can have an alternative to kind of wallet? Yeah, I mean, I, I hope it will. Um, between that and the Chrome, this this Chrome wallet and anything else that comes up, I mean, I, I think definitely there there's a big need for um, I think mobile wallets. Um, counter wallet is not a mobile wallet, uh, and so to have to have a web based mobile wallet or a mobile app. Um, would be great. That would that that's a gap. So any any developers listening out there that that want to create something, uh, just get in touch with us with that. That would be great. Um, I, I think that the GUI itself, for the like I said, for the people that want that full node experience, that full node safety, or they just want they just are tinkers and they just want to install the software and get to know it. Um, I think that that GUI will. It's it's more of a basic client. It doesn't do everything that CounterWallet does, but. Um, you can send and receive things, and or you can also use the command line interface, which is which is pretty functional, and you can do every, everything in Counterparty through that command line interface. 
So we, we've talked before, before a little bit about the sort of, you know, the larger vision of an, uh, adding functionality on top of Bitcoin. Uh, can you talk a bit about what uh, different things you've enabled, such as, you know, issuing assets, dividends, and which ones of those have been the most uh, widely used and most important? Um, yeah, I mean, there's been several things that we've done. We've issued... Um, or, well, no, we haven't issued... Uh, well, I mean, there was XCP in, in how we do that, and we talked about that earlier. Um, there's been other ones like, uh, you know, LTP coin was a big one. Swarm was a big one since it was such a big crowd sale at that time. And, um, it, it, it showed kind of the viability of counterparty to be able to, uh, be used to, to raise a significant amount of money. Amount of money. I think they raised one, one, the equivalent of 1.2 million at the time, uh, 1.2 million dollars. Um, and then I think that Coinify coming around was a pretty Im important, uh, development because, they, you know, I think the crowdfunding model got some slack be, or got some flack because um, people say, well, what if someone just takes takes some money and and and, and they don't produce anything? Um, so Coinify kind, of, kind, of, kind of refined that by having this multi-sig where where the money raised was held in in trust basically where um, there were milestones established and upon some third party or or some neutral people. Uh, more neutral people establishing that these milestones were fulfilled, they would release some amount of the funds. So I think it's it's a better way to do crowdfunding. I think that it it it, it which the whole purpose is to provide to provide money to allow these companies to finish their products, for instance. Um, so I think that was an important development. Um, I mean, there, there's there's been several other coins uh, that have developed uh, can come about. Um, I'm drawing a blank here, but it's 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 always good to see more stuff happening. Um, I think that the the I'm I'm glad that that the crowdfunding, for instance, is maturing nicely, and that that uh, you know there's there's you know in the, especially in the altcoin space, there's been issues with people doing a crowdfunding, taking the money. But I think people are getting more sophisticated, able to spot those scams easier. And I think when in new and innovative business models like Coinify, for instance, and, and, and Swarm are allowing people to have means where they can contribute money and benefit from the functionality of these new applications and, and whatnot um, without without as much as a risk that it could all be just stolen and taken. So it, so I think both of those are important. So go, going uh, further than uh, so we talk about crowdfunding uh, and, and uh, funding projects, Going further, what are some of the most interesting um, or some of the more interesting use cases that you expect to see uh, Counterparty being used for in the future? Um, I, you know, we, we created Counterparty as really from the start to be a financial, um, to be for financial markets. And uh, that was our idea. I think that, I think with everybody, the decentralized exchange, to be frank, it's it's a great idea, and I think that it can work. It, it does work, and it can work well. And Counterparty does have some issues interfacing with Bitcoin itself, um, and people do use it today. For Counterparty assets, it's very smooth. Um, so it provides a good alternative to the to the exchanges, but it, it also does come down to ease of use, and, and people still can keep using centralized exchanges, even with the security issues they have, because everyone else is, and they're, they're easy to use. So, um, you know, seeing the decentralized exchange potentially used in different ways would be good. Um, I think the main stuff for us is we, uh, from the counterparty founder's perspective, um, there are some things, uh, you know, voting is being used more, like for the foundation elections, we're working on that. We're doing blockchain-based voting, and blocks can add a voting interface to their web interface, for instance, where you can see the current votes, and I think, I think Folding Coin, for instance, has some vote going on, too, and I was looking at it about a week ago. Um, so that's available over at blockscan.com. You can see people doing voting on the blockchain right now using Counterparty, which is really neat. Um, what we're doing is, uh, as the founders, we're really we're really focused um, on taking this technology and really extending it into the financial services uh, markets. And I think that that was really the idea be, uh, behind. Um, uh, similar to like what Overstock's trying to do with Medici and with um, uh, with 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 uh, the startup that we recently started called Symbian, um, and and really kind of having bringing this blockchain technology into these markets 
um, uh, to, to address structural issues, to ha help lead to more transparent markets, and to address really, it's really the whole thing is really, I think, fundamentally based around you have these really, uh, in a lot of ways, archaic and um, centralized uh, and just, just you know, you know these, um, these, these models of how these systems work and just, just taking this technology and helping to improve that. So we, we want to talk about uh, Overstock and, and your company in a second, but one, one topic that has gotten a lot of attention and uh, that was very controversial at the time was when you guys, uh, I think it was last November, uh, announced that you're basically forking Ethereum and sort of taking in the functionality uh, of Ethereum in Counterparty. Um, how does that work? Yeah, so uh, initially, uh, that's a good question. Initially, um, we were... We were we were forking Ethereum and forking the code. Um, there's a there's a Python Ethereum library called Py Ethereum, and we decided to, you know, let's just fork that, but keep compatibility with Ethereum it's, itself, the project itself. Um, what we shifted it recently to doing, well, maybe not that recently, but um, we're actually we're actually taking the Py Ethereum library as is, the, the current plan is, and just and just porting it. Um, to a newer version of Python and contributing those changes back to Ethereum, and then we're using that PY Ethereum library directly. So it, it benefits, it, it really benefits both Counterparty and Ethereum because we're contributing back to the Ethereum code base. Um, we're working together more, and uh, we, we get that smart contracts functionality uh, that Ethereum has, but we just embed that in the, in the Bitcoin blockchain and the Counterparty database, a combination of both. So, um, it's not really, I you know, the the media likes to they like to blow it up and counterparty versus Ripple fight to the death kind of stuff. It's not really like that at all. I think that, uh, we, that, that I think that uh, you know we have a lot of respect for the, the Ethereum guys what they're trying to do, and um, there's value in this technology and this smart contracts implementation on on Bitcoin, and um, I think that we can work together to to kind of accomplish a lot of really neat stuff. But, so. so so how does the the verification and consensus work here, right? Because with counterparty, the normal transactions, I mean, they're embedded in the Bitcoin blockchain, but mm -hmm. I presume you can't do the same thing when it comes to all these other smart contract features. Yeah, so like with Ethereum, they embed a lot of the, the smart contract. I think the data state is embedded in, or part of it at least is embedded in the blockchain with Patricia trees and, 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 um, ha and you know, mind and hash and all that stuff. I think that with... Um, with counterparty, we don't have that because of Bitcoin. However, so how it works basically is that when you create a contract, that contract is broadcast to the blockchain and it's embedded in the blockchain. So everyone has the same contract that's actually in the Bitcoin blockchain. And then when that contract runs, everyone is running the same code of counterparty, this or at least the same context or uh, uh, what is it, uh, consensus sensitive code, which means that protocol level code. Um, so they get the same output. Everyone running this contract code will get the same data, data uh, uh, output. Um, that data state is actually saved into the counterparty um, database, and, and that the database stores as a data storage with that. And so, so um, every node reads off the Bitcoin blockchain. They read the same contract code. They execute that contract. And the state is is put into the uh, counterparty database, and the contract runs again, and it gets a current state from the database, and it reads it and writes it. Um, we do have um, checkpoint code that we do with the counterparty transactions that, like, we actually hash this, ha hash the current state of tables at a specific block, and then that's included into the client, so that you can make sure that that uh, there, there's consensus at, at specific block numbers, and we can ensure that. Um, so we do have checkpointing. Um, I think. Adam would be the best one to answer this, but I, we, you know, we, we could checkpoint for the data state as well. I don't think we are doing that today, but um, but it's basically it is a mix of the Bitcoin blockchain and, and the database. Where can people learn more about uh, this? Because there seems to be some confusion about where what URL to use to find more about this. Um, well, I mean, on, on the Counterparty website, you can just go to the docs section and you can get a lot of information there. From the smart contracts perspective, if you want to know how to write smart contracts and things like that, um, I think that we we did have a press release when we release this, we release it that shows an example of uh, I can forward those those URLs that shows an example of uh, publishing a contract. 
but as far as as far as a language goes, like Serpent, I think Ethereum has a better resources there. Um, right, but is is this EtherParty.io or .org? Because there's two websites. There, there is an EtherParty. That's not something that we're doing, but that's okay. something that people in the community uh, people in the community did. Um, uh, let's see here. Well, no, they actually changed it into a company. See, this is a, <laughs> there was an Ether Party, which was basically formed uh, at the time of this announcement, and they had like this cool test website where you could publish contracts. And I think that's still around. But yeah, I saw that. It was some sort of a like you could drag and drop uh, yeah. your contract pieces into some sort of a puzzle. And... I th yeah, I think they built a company, or they're building a company around it. I don't. I'd have to see who's be behind who's behind this, but. Um, where essentially I think they're capitalizing on the fact that we're using the same thing. So you say, hey, you have a, a smart contract. You can do it on Counterparty or Ethereum or whatnot, and we'll help you do that is what this looks like. Looks like. Okay. So, but this is what I'm talking about. People take this technology and they just, they just create stuff out of it, which is awesome to see. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, surprised and happy to see that they're, they're, they're doing something here. So... Does running this running on top of the Bitcoin blockchain also mean that uh, because Ethereum has a very different block time, uh, does that mean you will be the sort of kind of party uh, smart contract blocks will also be ten minutes long? Um, yeah, I mean it's a Bitcoin block time, so it's ten minutes. So if I uh, I publish a smart contract, I call one that's an instruction the smart contract. Um, it does happen on those average ten minute block times with Counterparty. Okay, cool. I'd, there's been a lot of talk about block time, and, and, and people are like, oh, it's going to be too long on Bitcoin, but, you know, people are using Counterparty today, and I, I, I think that, um, I mean, great. I mean, you know, one-minute block times would be great in, in a lot of regards, but um, 10 minutes was chosen. It's just really, with the other parameters of Bitcoin, it's, it's worked really well from a security perspective. So, um, and, 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 and people think it's a problem, or they think it will be a problem, and then they just start using Counterparty, and it hasn't really been an issue. So, uh, speaking a little bit about the sort of the future of Counterparty before maybe we talk about your projects, what are the most uh, the most exciting potentials of this technology? Um, I, I mean, I would say uh, Counterparty itself, or just a general uh, blockchain or whatnot. Well, Counterparty itself, perhaps. Okay. I, I mean, they're kind of related. I mean, there's things that there's all sorts of stuff you can do with this. I mean, this is. Um, I think this technology has the ability. It's really going to disrupt finance, and I think law is coming after that with with the the, uh, the maturation of smart contracts technology. I mean, we're really. I mean, I can tell you by being in it day out, day in day in and day out, we are really at the start of. Um, blockchains are is still, uh, you know, rather primitive. And um, the smart contracts technology is still rather primitive, and um, you know, in the upcoming years, we're going to have uh, making blockchains more scalable. A, a, you know, able to handle more transactions. All the research that's going on into that, development around that, um, as well as making just like really smooth, workable smart contract implementations, and then all the user support tools like uh, IDEs and GUIs and stuff to make that easy to easy to do and integrate it into like traditional web technologies. Um, so that that that's exciting to see this to see this uh, really build out. It's kind of like in the internet. Uh, people compared it to this all the time, but like the internet, like ninety five, ninety six, whatever, where you had these primitive tools, or you had things like uh, Netscape, and it was it was, um, you know, ghetto was all hack, and 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 but it but it but it worked, and people were using it, and you know, I remember the first time I saw a web page from, I uh, went to the server in Switzerland, or, or it was in Europe somewhere, maybe Sweden. And saw this web page. I was like, just blew my mind. It was like, <clears throat> I was a, I was a kid at the time, and um, it was really cool. And so we're seeing a lot of the same initial experimentation of people just taking this technology. I think as far as specific use cases, I would say that we're really focused on finance. So um, there are certain areas in finance that are that are ripe for disruption, and um, where this naturally decentralized model can work very well. And that's really kind of what we're focusing with Symbian uh, a lot on as far as developing solutions for that. Um, and I think that, so it, it'll be cool to see, um, because it does matter, you, you have 
2008 was really a crisis of trust and um, where um, you know you you might have had legal agreements but it was very clear unclear who owned what what financial assets uh, where the real ownership was um, everything was like net settled which basically they don't they don't take the actual move them like if you're moving money around you actually just move the difference around at the end of the day instead of moving the the whole amount over back and forth between the parties so it's it's hard, it's it, it the, that really kind of gets rid of things like ownership rights and things like that where it's, it's hard to tell who owns what but with the blockchain you can do gross settlement and you can preserve ownership rights so that really matters when you get into the root causes of financial crisis um, this rehypothecation of uh, these derivatives this leverage um, it, it provides the technological solutions to really have a strong audit trail and to be able to tell um, uh, with much more certainty who owns what, you know, with even cryptographic certainty, um, who owns what assets, verify, verify the ownership of those assets, um, trade and settle those assets much quicker. Um, so for me, that's, that's really exciting, and um, it's been... So we, we've had a lot of uh, episodes recently where we've talked with people who have sort of similar aspirations and they view the kind of anonymity of Bitcoin mining more as a liability in that context because if you sell it to a bank, right, a bank will be like, who controls this? And they may prefer having a solution where maybe it's a network of banks that sort of administer the network and determine consensus. Do you think it will be possible to sell these kind of services, like sort of based on Bitcoin to banks to use for settlement or to do the things you were just talking about? Um, that's a really good question and it's kind of like the, the, the your question is like the tip of an iceberg because there's a lot under that question. Um, I, I think that you know with, with Symbian we take a overall uh, very pragmatic approach um, that we 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 focus on. I mean, it's it's. I don't think you can. I'm trying to say how to state this. Um, that you know, much like there's there's going to be a maturation of thought. I think with the banks and people like there's just like on Reddit there were probably Bitcoin Reddit there were probably uh, two threads with all these comments about oh if it doesn't have if it's a private blockchain and it doesn't have the Bitcoin token then it's not a it's it's not a blockchain. And, and it's actually a, um, it's something else. And it's kind of like a database. And why don't they just use a database? Uh, I don't fully agree with that. I mean, I think I take blockchain being a literal thing where it's, it's essentially a box which, in, which, which, which embed transactions and then it's chained together by the hashing of previous blocks all the way back to the, to the first block. Um, you know, Bitcoin is, is great because what it does is you have this open and uh, what can, uh, 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 an open, a decentralized distributed network with um, anonymous or potentially anonymous participants acting, uh, you know, packaging transactions and blocks, storing the data, um, and then and then you know doing this hash cash game where they where they get the ability to uh, privilege to, to package those transactions and get the Bitcoin award a uh, reward, um, and that that's why Bitcoin exists to incentivize those people to act within the good of, of the of maintaining this network and and um, encoding these transactions and to work together to those ends so um, but when you go into private blockchains um, you don't need a Bitcoin token you, you, you can get rid of it if you have trusted and known uh, a, a private network of these known participants and you yes you do lose a lot of the benefits that you have with Bitcoin um, but you can also make it much more um, optimized but I think it does have advantages over like a day, just a plain old database because you do have um, you do have cryptographically verified by verifiable integrity. <clears throat> you do have a cryptographically verifiable audit trail. Um, so I think initially with a lot of the the industry level adoption, I think it's going to be with um, you could see a lot of private blockchain use. Um, and um, you know, Bitcoin does have a quote unquote legitimacy problem. I think in some areas. Um, but I think that even with that, like you can, there there could be value if you have a syndicate of banks that are that are mining this blockchain, um, because you look in it with like another issue, potential issue with Bitcoin is that you could have miners in some a country like South Korea or um, I'm I'm sorry, like North Korea or Iran, um, that technically it's unclear, but there are laws saying that you can't operate with anybody from North Korea and Iran. There's banking laws. It's unclear still uh, whether you would essentially be breaking the law. 
and, and, and commercial banks take that very seriously. So that's another thing that kind of keeps them from something like Bitcoin. Just this, it just, It's nothing like anything that any of them have ever seen before. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a that's a great point. So, with your company Symbiont, are you if if you're focusing on financial products, does that mean you're also focusing on uh, maybe delivering solutions where they're not actually Bitcoin based, but uh, blockchain, these kind of private blockchains without the Bitcoin token? Yeah, I mean that's that's always an option with what we do. I think that um, yeah, you know, in in in. By default, we use counterparty technology and we use Bitcoin by default. Um, Bitcoin is a very well-established network and, and it's, it's been proven out. Um, but at the same time, I mean, we're solving solutions for, for, for clients. So if, if it's just evaluating what the best technology is for, for these, uh, uh, you know, for, for the needs, for what we're trying to do. And, um, and, I, and I don't think that you can... Um, I, I personally think there would be some value to these "quote unquote" private blockchains. I think they still have they still have advantages over like a, a, a database, just an existing extant database technology. Um, I, I just think that it's so early in the game that that the thought has um, the technology is still rapidly maturing. Um, a lot of the stuff that we do on a day to day to day basis does not exist, and we have to create it you know, out of thin air. It's just like you know, you're just making those decisions, just like we did with Counterparty. You're just like, well, it doesn't exist. Let's let's do it. Like, you know, um, and and I think also the uh, the the thought and the 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 evolution of the like the human level things need to evolve too, where people are deciding about um, the current financial system is very centralized. It's very um, it's very labor intensive, you know. Like, there's and there and it, it, it's it's very cap capital intensive, very labor intensive. I mean, you go. It's the reason you go into a go into any city, U.S. city. You know, look at the look at the skyline. What are the tallest buildings you see? They're they're nine times out of ten bank buildings, um, and and this is kind of the the industry that's being disrupted here. And uh, the technology makes it so that you can really reduce the amount of labor it takes to 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 do this. And and. Uh, so there's going to be an evolution of thought there as far as what does this mean? How do we utilize the technology? You know, what's the extent of disruption? Uh, what are the advantages, uh, like lowered costs, things like that? Um, um, so there, there's, there's pros and cons, and, and we just have to work through that whole process, I, I think, collectively, the, 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 the whole country and the whole world, I think, over the next uh, 10 or 20 years. So can you tell us about the, this uh, sort of, I guess, Spin-off project from the counterparty team, which is uh, Symbiont. Can you tell us about that, that company and what you guys are trying to achieve? Yeah, I mean, I can talk about it at a high level. So the idea behind Symbiont is to basically take um, this technology, uh, counterparty technology, blockchain technology, and apply it to um, uh, uh, specific uh, issues in the financial space um, or, or specific markets, uh, specific use cases, um, that that have certain uh, characteristics and 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 can can where this technology can pose big benefits to to those that were not maybe not normally possible in the past. So that that's kind of a high level overview. I can't get, really get into exactly what those markets are, but 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 those are you know it's it's like we have this cool new technology and 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 we and and, and you have the financial know how and you can kind of link the two together and that's really why we call this symbiont because. Uh, symbiosis and biology it's, it's you know two two organisms working through the benefit of, of, of both and um, and that's really what this is it's a combination of the technology with the f uh, financial markets and financial services industry to um, um, you know for the benefit of both the technology gets more adoption and, and is more wider spread and the financial service and benefits from that technology Cool. Uh, I think we'll be looking forward to, to seeing what comes out of that. Uh, another project that you guys have been involved, you and I think your co-founder with Counterparty, is that uh, stock exchange that Overstock was, and Patrick Byrne and, and this company was trying to build, I think it was called Medici. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what the project was about and uh, why you guys ended up leaving? Yeah, so the idea behind Medici was to create a, uh, a, a, a it is to create a decentralized stock exchange. Um, uh, it, you know, these are these are equities, um, and it was going to be it's it. Well, I mean, last when I was involved, it was a, a user a user um, 
focus. So, so for retail, for retail users instead of for institutional investors. Now, I haven't had much communications with Overstock, so I can't say if that's still the plans. And, and um, um, but as from what I know, they're still work. They're still working towards those ends. Um, they stated that they're still using Counterparty. Last I heard, um, but 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 are you know open to other technologies as well. Um, and we still have good relationships with Overstock um, and, and talk to them from time to time. So I, I think that um, uh, as, far as, as far as why we left, I think that it was, it was a few factors. I think that there was, um, uh, uh, there was this, there, I mean, there, there was nothing like, uh, um, there wasn't any animosity or anything like that. It wasn't any, anything really negative. It was more just like a direction kind of thing as far as, um, getting getting some arrangement together, getting those terms finalized, and then also as far as like the question of is is you know there's so many there's so many areas in the financial services space um, is is equities the best because there's so many regulations around uh, if you do anything that 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 inter interacts with a mom and pop like Joe Joe Sixpack or whoever um, there are so many regulations and so. Um, yes, you can. You can. You know, if it was just about the technology, we could have the technology put together in six months for that. But then you've got to get uh, approval to to market, uh, disclose, um, you know, interface, uh, enable trading with those kinds of investors. Um, and and there are a lot when when you're talking equities, there's a lot of hoops to jump jump through. So I think it was a combination of multiple factors. But but you know, they're not. There's not. There's no really bad blood between between the, the parties. Yeah, I always thought it was a bit of a, um, a crazy, uh, ambitious goal to create a decentralized stock exchange. I mean, I think that's that just is something that's going to be extremely difficult to get through. But uh, it will be, of course, interesting to see if they can actually make it happen. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I say, I say, you know, I can I can tell you that at least with the current business model, Symbian and Overstock are not they're not competitors. Um, we're working on different problems in the space, and and um, we definitely wish them the best of luck with with, with everything. Cool. Well, uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, it was really interesting learning a bit more about Counterparty, I and mean, I think it's a project that many heard about. We've certainly heard and talked about it often, but we've never had the chance to sort of really uh, dive into it and uh, get a bit deeper into the topic. So, thanks so much for its uh, opportunity. Absolutely, and it, I think if anybody watching this uh, wants to learn more, you can just go to our website, counterparty.io. We have we have developer chat channels that you can join up and ask questions. Um, we have a forums, forums.counterparty.io. Uh, you can go and ask questions, get support, all that kind of stuff, and we'd love to see more users of the technology, more developers, uh, everything, just have the community grow like it's been doing. Yeah, I was really impressed with the, just the wealth of support that you guys have uh, available on your website so uh, I think it's a really good job on uh, getting getting support uh, available for people who want to develop well, I, yeah, I think the reason is we're <laughs> we're, 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 we're uh, I don't know I'm lazy I don't want to if, if I can write something to support people <laughs> I, you know the one of the top virtues of a, of a software developer is laziness so if you can if I can write something that people support people then I think that we want to do that versus answering the same kind of questions so um, I think that that's 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 kind of uh, led a lot of that. <laughs> cool, fantastic. Well, uh, thanks so much, yeah, for joining us. We will have links in the show, and uh, to our listeners, thanks for watching. We will be back next week.